Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next edition of the BioXL webinar series. My name is Rosen Apostolov, and I will be today's host. BioXL Center of Excellence, as uh, you might know, is the leading center of excellence for computational biomolecular research in uh, Europe. And through the webinar series, we are aiming to feature notable scientists and their work, uh, some of the novel tools in the domain of biomolecular research um, and uh, anything exciting happening in the, in the domain. And uh, today is uh, our uh, pleasure to, to give you a webinar about how to understand better the parameters uh, used by GROMOX, one of the very popular uh, engines for molecular dynamic simulations. GROMOX is one of the core applications in BioXL uh, and a lot of the development uh, is uh, running in the center. And uh, with that, I'd like to present to everyone Christian Blau, who is a researcher at the KTH Rowe Institute of Technology in Sweden. He received his PhD with uh, Helmut Grubmüller at Max Planck Institute for Bio uh, Physical Chemistry in Göttingen. And, um, Already for four years, he's been working as a researcher in Stockholm, uh, currently in the group of uh, Eric Lindau, and he's part of the core developer team of Gromox. His main work is on Gromox development, uh, but he's also interested in driving simulations using experimental data, in particular cryo-electron microscopy studies. So welcome, Christian, and pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thank you, Rossen, for the very kind introduction. Um, today's uh, topic uh, was picked uh, due to lots of uh, users um, expressing their um, concern about their simulation setups, or questions whether they set up their simulations correctly. And uh, this is an attempt to answer to these questions. And of course, um, if we are extremely thorough with everything, um, we would sit for another 20 hours maybe here going through all the methods and all details, going through all MD, but I uh, still want to give you a basic understanding of what is important when you run your simulations. So what do we actually want from Gromex or with our simulation setups? We want to um, take a structure, add a force field and uh, some additional parameters. And from this via simulation, go to some biophysically, uh, chemically relevant results via an analysis uh, step. So um, it's quite a simple setup of um, very few like, conceptual pragmatic ingredients here. Um, and these things you see reflected in Gromix in different types of file formats. So you'll have the PDB and GROW files that uh, give you the structure. You have the force field that is describing the interatomic interactions and so on in the top files and um, external parameters in the MDP file. So this makes for a quite um, a simple split of things and uh, so far this uh, I think is a relatively easy to understand issue. Um, the moment things get complicated maybe and maybe the first step where I want to clarify some things is when we look a bit deeper in what the parameter, the MDP option file actually does uh, to your simulation and also to your analysis. So um, what we do in Gromix as a first thing is we gather all the things that make a simulation and pre-process them into a TPR file. The Gromix preprocessor does this just gathering and lumping together all types of information and from that on we start the simulation. And, um, and we have a look at uh, what the parameters in the MDP file actually influence, then we see that um, and what your simulation actually influences, we see that there's a bit of a um, this village and of what the parameters in your MDP file actually affect. So we observe that uh, some things in the parameter file then actually do um, interplay with uh, your force field. Uh, That's an extremely important thing to take note of. And I think one of the uh, main reasons for um, concern for some users uh, on what parameters to set and how to set them correctly. Then we see that some parameters um, don't really go so much into the analysis and results part, but rather how long you have to wait for them. Uh, that is a parameters that purely affect the performance of your run. 
but um, not much of the physical treatment of your system. And uh, then there's parameters that um, just affect how much of your run you actually get to see in the analysis. And depending on what type of analysis you do, um, so you might also see an effect uh, only up to the analysis, but not in the results uh, section, then when you, um, for example, do an analysis where you skip every other step uh, of your simulation. And then as an extra thing, and I just added this for the completeness here, we of course have uh, other options to the run that are not part of the TPR file, that are the command line options to the um, MD run command that also affect your simulation. That is something that will go into yet another um, webinar uh, topic uh, I will not cover today. So uh, let's have a look at uh, the parameters in more detail as promised. Um, so. The easiest thing we can do when setting up a Gromit simulation, I think a quite instructive thing to do is uh, just give no parameters at all. Um, so it really does work to uh, run GromPP with a completely empty parameter file that has uh, nothing in it. It's just really a file um, parameters.mdp and run the pre-processing tool. And uh, what you observe there is that we'll give you an answer, you know, nevertheless, and also generate a TPR file. And um, that TPR file's parameters are reflected in the mdout.mdp. Now, that is uh, the first thing I suggest you to look at, um, because this will also tell you how we interpreted your parameters and what kind of uh, default parameters have been set um, in your run. And what I'll stick through throughout the talk is showing what happens um, when you just don't set anything. So what are the default parameters? What do you get as a kind of, if you just don't set anything? And then trying to discuss these things, uh, saying which parameters you have to think about, which parameters you should set, what parameters are quite okay, always depending on your science, of course, uh, to keep on the defaults. So let's uh, look at what you get um, when you run such a default file. Header information is uh, not to be neglected because this makes sure that you are actually looking at the right file. You get quite some information about how you generated the specific uh, file and uh, you get to learn uh, if you receive, for example, a foreign MDP file, um, some information about how this uh, whole thing was uh, generated. Then we have another part that is um, called the various pre-processing options here depicted on the right hand side where you see the um, pre-processor information for example this really goes into the top part of uh, your um, simulation setup that is uh, the topology the um, interactions can be altered to some extent by these pre-processing options and um, something um, to look into if you have modified uh, force fields or want to do very special things for mo uh, and useful if you want to use restraints. Uh, usually uh, something for vanilla MD runs as we look in here right now, um, something we would uh, not consider more depth exactly right now. Uh, then comes uh, one of um, the things I want to really hint you to and this is um, just the easiest advice I can give you always is uh, reading the uh, manual and uh, you find this under the uh, web address given here, manualgromics.org, current user guide, MDP options. And um, if you replace current with uh, the Gromix version you're using, you also get the manual for that version. But uh, of course, we always urge you to use the most uh, current stable version of Gromix and that's exactly where you get an overview over all the MDP options. Um, available um, with uh, some explanatory text. Now let's have a look at the, the first really decisive MDP option, uh, maybe the most decisive one on the whole run, that is uh, what type of integrator you use, that is how do you want to propagate your atom coordinates in your simulation. And there's um, overall six base types of um, ways you can do this and um, most of the time, we only see two of them in practice. Um, that is uh, energy minimization and Newton's equations of motion we want to solve. So um, then other um, features 
you might see are stochastic integrators uh, that use Langevin dynamics. Um, so they say stochastic um, dynamics and Brownian dynamics integrated here. You can perform normal mode analysis um, with Gromix still baked into the MD run machine because uh, this likes to look at all the force field interactions. You can um, test the chemical potentials of particles you insert uh, doing a rerun with Gromix. And uh, you can use the whole of Gromix as a uh, slave for a quantum mechanics application called Mimic, where uh, Mimic actually drives the molecular dynamics and Gromix is the part that um, does the interaction energy calculation. But these are rather special topics. So right here, the main mindset I'm in when presenting these options is really the vanilla and the run, um, the run that really takes a protein and wants to sample its uh, confirmations without many other uh, things around it. But I, here and there, I'll say something about the other options. Um, so let's have a look at um, the options in detail when we just go through and as promised I'll really just walk through the options as we see them in the MDP files. Um, let's see what this default file gives us. It gives us an initial time at zero and um, a um, time step of 0.001 femtoseconds. And here on the right hand side I show you what I think is a reasonable good practice and maybe some clarification. For uh, the most part, uh, the start times and so on should be taken care by checkpoint files. Um, so uh, that saves you lots of work uh, manually uh, changing parameters. And you see a bit of the times remnant um, in parameter settings you often don't have to care about from a time before checkpoint files um, when you had to manually rebuild a TPR file. Now we can really just use these and rely on these wherever possible. And I suggest you do that if you want to continue simulation runs. Um, just right now I noticed that I also didn't change the end steps option. Of course the zero steps is not very exciting. Um, for lots of cases, I think even with computer centers, it's a good idea to use a minus one end steps and uh, to um, really rather have uh, your simulations limited by time and time allocations. Um, that is uh, often something compute centers like um, to see in usage. And also this allows you to uh, post process and not decide in advance. But of course uh, that um, depends on how you want to do things. For the time interval, um, yeah, for vanilla MD, uh, two femtoseconds is a good uh, time step. And if you use virtual sites, which you get activated when using PDB to GMX minus V site, then you can go up to time step of um, four femtoseconds. The next option is the center of mass movement removal option. And uh, there I really um, suggest for the most part use the defaults, um, use uh, the linear um, center of mass motion removal to avoid a flying ice cube effect for uh, the almost all simulation settings that is just reasonable. And um, if this would require some other setting, usually you, you already know about it in detail. Um, the Langevin dynamics is something I will really not go into details here, but um, if you need uh, some more information about that, you're interested in that, there's a whole section in the reference manual that explains some stochastic dynamics you can do with Chromix. Um, for, the, for the energy minimization, next step of parameters, um, the defaults usually are quite tight and really good uh, parameters to use. In most cases, you really don't need to change anything. You might not even go down to the lowest uh, parameter set here, but you might um, converge to something else and stop uh, the energy minimization slightly before it. Uh, this is really just safe to use as a default for the largest part. Um, then uh, there are some other energy minimization options for very special uh, models. Again, the shell molecular dynamics for polarizability of some certain models included. But there again, if you're using this, you know what uh, you're using here. I guess uh, you would otherwise go to the manual where you have a much more um, explanation of this, of this rather special case. And um, then um, as another option you can use is um, that you can use a conjugate gradient um, 
and um, LBFGS algorithms to achieve uh, better uh, um, energy minimized structures, sometimes needed, for example, for quantum mechanical calculations. Also, they, uh, the defaults usually work quite neatly. Uh, then comes uh, the test particle insertion option. Um, then, for use with MDV1, uh, I'll not touch on this again. Uh, here you can see things um, described a bit more in detail in the manual. Uh, we jump to the next section. So now we have uh, determined what type of MD simulation we want to do and uh, how we want to propagate our coordinates, what type, what type of uh, integrator. Now it's all about how much information you want to get out of your uh, simulation. And um, again, here we see that uh, historically we used to write full precision TRL files that took up lots of space and uh, could be used for resetting your simulation. That's where you have the uh, coordinate X out, uh, velocity V out, and force out um, output frequencies. Um, here you can save lots of uh, disk space by just leaving the defaults to zero and um, take checkpoint files to um, continue your simulation run in case you need to. Um, unless you're specifically interested in this information, uh, usually that is not needed. What you would rather use is uh, the um, XCC files. So um, we see uh, further down in the section the output frequency and precision for the XCC file defined. Here again, um, you can use the default parameters uh, for precision um, that have proven to be uh, quite useful. and. Uh, the output frequency itself depends very much on your simulation system. So um, it's all given in steps here. That means if there's um, an NST X out compressed of a thousand, that means you will have output every two uh, picoseconds if you use the two femtosecond time step, or every four of the uh, picoseconds if you use the four femtosecond time step. Um, then up there, you see some other parameters for the energy output to the log file um, and log file frequency. Um, so you can say how often you want to write to the log file. Um, that is a good way to check that your simulation runs neatly. Um, also writes uh, some energies to the log file here. Uh, then um, the energy file is a quite useful um, thing to look into your simulation. What happens, however, is uh, that you require to calculate the energy. So if you output the energy every step, you drastically include the uh, workload. Every thousand steps is usually a very good um, indicative uh, range of uh, looking into the energies, where you will learn what you would need about the energies. And uh, there's another slightly mysterious parameter, the NST calc energy uh, parameter. And really this one you can leave at the default or set to minus one because this nowadays is reset by Chromix internally to match um, the energy output frequencies and other um, options you set in your simulations. Then um, further down you see the compressed X groups where you want to use uh, the protein or the part of the system you're interested in, uh, maybe using system. Um, here, that is, a, of course, something to think about a bit more before starting a simulation that uh, runs for a long time and gives you no data you would like to use. There's uh, another um, thing you can use for uh, reruns, especially. Uh, these are energy groups where you have uh, non-bonded interaction energies output. Um, so you can't have this output on the GPU, but what you can do is create a trajectory on a GPU use uh, the MD run minus rerun option, and then look into the energy groups behavior here, but uh, use the output with care because the energy groups here don't take care of uh, uh, long range non-bonded interactions via PME. So um, that is rather to be used as an indicative measure oftentimes. Good. Um, now we dive deeper and deeper into uh, the Gromex engine and um, also go deeper and deeper into um, the MD algorithms in this case here. For uh, the neighbor searching, that is, um, how do we find the closest atoms? Uh, nowadays, there's just one scheme we can use, so there's really, so you don't have to think about it. Um, 
in the newest Gromix release and the older Gromix releases, you could use the group scheme, uh, which already then was deprecated. So Rayleigh is really uh, the thing to do. And um, with this, you can safely stick to the um, default NST list, uh, the neighbor list update frequency uh, of 10. For the periodic boundary conditions, you will know what you want, but almost always that is um, the periodic boundaries in X, Y, and Z directions. And almost always, unless you um, simulate infinite periodic molecules, you would also have periodic molecules set to no. Um, then um, for the Bailey buffer tolerance, and this is the most uh, determining step, uh, uh, parameter for all the neighbor searching options. This um, should stay at the default unless you know exactly what you're doing and gives you how much error you allow the system to do if, while doing efficient neighbor searching. This error tolerance is quite low, allows for the best balance of uh, the algorithm to be set. And uh, this valley buffer tolerance itself determines the R list parameter. So also they just keep the default. Um, it will be reset by Gromix when the Lee buffer tolerance is defined. So all in all, for the whole neighbor searching parameters, what you need uh, for the vanilla simulation case is uh, the default parameters all over um, with no changes. Um, then we come to the other part that plays into the force field uh, together, um, so the options for the electrostatic and Van der Waals parameters. And here I slightly resorted uh, the output from the MDP file just to be uh, consistent. We talk about electrostatics first and then talk about Leonard Jones parameters. And um, here um, the largest Care has to be taken with uh, respect to what you do in the force field. Most force fields are parameterized and work with um, PME, so this is the option you almost always want. And uh, also the Coulomb modifier that could potentially shift. Uh, you want the default parameter here. Um, the R Coulomb switch is then ignored with a particle mesh evil method. And also for the R Coulomb, you would um, use the default parameter. And here we have uh, with the particle mesh eval option, uh, this Coulomb radius parameter really just determines how much work you do in Fourier space versus how much work you do in real space. And we see it below this so Fourier spacing parameter set. And uh, generally, we suggest a ratio of Fourier spacing over R Coulomb to be fixed to 0.125. So um, this two parameters can be tuned also at the beginning of the simulation and are uh, tuned at the beginning of the simulation. And uh, here, um, this ratio of the parameters should be kept constant, um, but this will lead, if the ratio is kept constant, this will lead to the same results here. Then uh, these uh, Fourier NX, NY, and Z parameters um, are automatically determined and also there I strongly suggest um, keeping the default parameters unless um, you know exactly why and what you want to change here. Um, this goes all together with uh, tuning the best uh, performance for the Fourier space calculation part of the long range electrostatics. Um, for the um, PME order, that is um, how much effort do you do in approximating the um, particle mesh um, in um, with the B-splines. So that's a B-spline order. Usually four is a good choice, uh, but if you go to higher numbers here, you can uh, reduce overall communication. So if you simulate very large systems, go down to five might be something to get a bit more performance of your system. So uh, your options are four or five generally in here. Then um, for the um, tolerance of the eval summation here, I really suggest keeping the default parameters. Then uh, we have some more parameters for the eval geometry and epsilon surface uh, where we can suggest using the defaults. Um, so they are uh, meant 
to enable some different simulation if you have a geometry of a system so that have a large uh, z direction expansion then you could uh, gain something with uh, changing this option but for the most systems really uh, the default option is um, the one you would like to use here as well as uh, the absolute surface value to zero that would incorporate some type of dipole correction in your system which then um, again is not recommended to use when you have moving charges in your system which you will almost always have with here. Um, again um, all the other options uh, following further down um, were options to be used for reaction field for electrostatics and um, options that can stay at the defaults when you use the particle mesh evil to, um, parameters. The, you will see uh, an implicit solvent option and uh, this really is uh, not only deprecated but it's removed here so this parameter uh, setting to yes will um, even just uh, give you a warning that you cannot um, use implicit solvent. Uh, that's a feature that was present in Gromic some time ago but had been removed um, over the time. So this one is just not to be used. Now we come to um, one of the parts, I think if you lost a bit of your focus, I would really urge to take up focus again because this is uh, now one of the parts where you really can influence the physical accuracy of your simulation um, and uh, how much you match the, the force field um, you want to use and how much you really apply the actual force field you have been choosing. These are the van der Waals parameters you will see um, here. So for the um, van der Waals type and overall for the van der Waals parameter options, I would recommend using the parameters with, um, that came with the force field you're using and uh, checking the force field publications. By the way, the force field publications show up um, automatically on the PME to the PDB to GMX when you choose uh, the force field. Um, you will see the citation of the direct force field in case you wonder where uh, these parameters are published. If you use other force field parameters, again, also um, our suggestion is to read up on where these parameters come from and uh, how they are parameterized. So uh, in contrast to uh, the electrostatics, the van der Waals interaction type of, for the most force fields should be cut off um, and kept to default. We have implemented a PME um, treatment for um, force fields, which is uh, useful, for example, for uh, special binary systems. However, there you would have to make sure that you find parameters that also match that. So they, um, for most applications, the default is the best choice if you are really looking into membrane bilay systems. Uh, we uh, suggest um, checking then again um, if this requires maybe some more careful treatment of the uh, Van der Waals type if uh, your system is very inhomogenic. Um, otherwise, keep the cutoff and uh, check with the force field for the Van der Waals modifier. So at some point, the Van der Waals um, potential levels off. And uh, there you will have a, a choice between a potential shift parameter uh, that simply reshifts uh, the whole function and a switching function that uh, smoothly um, makes uh, the Van der Waals interaction go to zero after a certain color. And uh, there, the Ember and Charm force fields use different philosophies, and uh, that's why um, you should match the force field you're using here. Um, usually, Ember with potential shift and Charm with force switch. But again, uh, for different um, types of parameter sets in Charm, for example, there's a slightly different way uh, this had been handled. So please, uh, again, check the publication here. Uh, for the cutoff length themselves, um, also here, um, for Embry, you can use a zero because we use the potential shift and not a force switch for the uh, R van der Waals switch parameter. Charm usually uses one, and uh, for the van der Waals cutoff, Embry usually uses one, Charm uses 1.2, extends it uh, further. Yeah, so um, these are the most general cases. Um, one thing uh, we notice that 
people often miss is that the dispersion correction that is applied to the um, Van der Waals interactions. And um, here, um, the default option is uh, no, if you uh, check. And uh, here we, again, urge you to check the force field. Most often, energy and pressure um, is uh, um, to be required here for the dispersion correction. And uh, the further two options, um, the Ewald, Artol, Leonard Jones option and the Leonard Jones PME uh, combination rule um, really only apply when you use the uh, particle mesh Ewald implementation of Van der Waals interaction. And um, there again, uh, the defaults are a good choice. Now we go further uh, to setting the temperature in your system. And uh, if you want to run at a certain temperature, um, for most cases, no, we find that velocity rescale gives you a very nice thermostat that is very robust. And um, there you can use most of the default parameters um, set by Ingromix. Uh, now, if we go through uh, the um, coupling steps, we can keep a default of minus one. That means uh, the thermostat will couple every um, neighbor switching step. Um, that is um, all steps uh, when anyway global communication happens, the thermostat will update the temperature, which is usually a very fine frequency for doing that. And um, then um, we don't get extra communication overhead from setting this to a different frequency that doesn't match uh, the frequency where we anyway do uh, global communication in Gromix between all different um, nodes. And um, for other parameters, uh, the nodes a Hoover chain length and um, the printing of the variables, uh, they you can use the default variables um, and they even don't have any impact on the velocity rescale thermostat. Um, for the temperature coupling groups uh, here, I see I was a bit too generous. What I mean is protein and non-protein. Um, so, uh, yeah, usually uh, that's uh, the setup you would want to keep things uh, equally warm because uh, due to the um, heat conducting effects between protein and solvent, um, that is uh, usually recommended to have uh, two separate temperature coupling groups between the two. And um, for the coupling time, how tightly you want to couple your system to a certain temperature, we recommend that you use uh, 0.1, even though the velocity rescaling um, algorithm here is quite robust um, in contrast to some other systems. Uh, of course, the reference temperature uh, is the temperature at which your system should be at, um, which you have to know usually um, 300 um, Kelvin. Now we come to pressure coupling. If you are inclined to pressure couple for most of the biological systems you want to simulate, this is what you might want to do. Um, again, it's almost always the parallel Raman pressure coupling um, you would like to use. Um, and uh, also there you would like to keep analogously to the parameters set for the temperature coupling. The uh, default parameters for the coupling type and for the um, um, number of time steps during which you pressure couple uh, your system into the coupling type uh, you might want to change if you simulate membrane uh, systems to a semi-isotropic. Uh, the time constant um, is something that is a uh, Possible to set around 40 picoseconds uh, is one possible way to ensure that you don't have too tight, but also not to lose um, the pressure coupling. A common value used for the compressibility of your system is uh, the value just quoted here, 4.5 uh, times 10 to the power of minus three uh, parameter, as well as a, a reference pressure of a uh, one um, bar as a usual choice for atmospheric conditions. There's one more parameter in here, um, which is only relevant when pulling, but uh, doesn't show up when using a 
pulling things um, directly in the pull section, maybe something to um, pay attention to or something you should think about when um, applying any type of um, reference coordinate in your system that is absolute. Because suddenly with the pressure coupling, what is happening is that you um, scale your coordinates uh, system. So you scale your simulation box. That means also that slightly um, the position of um, coordinates does change now. You have to think about whether you want or you don't want your um, reference coordinate to follow along with this movement um, and uh, what type of reference coordinate. So whether all types of reference coordinates should just follow along with the scaled box movement or just the center of mass or not at all. Um, so uh, one thing to think about when pulling, um, otherwise um, not of relevance for the pressure coupling. Uh, there's um, a whole bunch of quantum mechanics options um, which we can safely skip for now um, and uh, they also uh, the, since uh, the group scheme has been removed uh, and deprecated uh, there's uh, no current QMMM implementation in Gromex that uh, uses apart from Mimic uh, that uses Gromex as uh, the driving implementation we are working on something along these lines one of the next releases, however. Uh, simulated annealing is exactly what it says. Um, you heat up your system according to certain time points. I think this is quite um, explanatory, but let me know if there's some questions about that. Then there's one other thing uh, that gets easily overlooked and which generates a slightly funnier in fact, and that is uh, generating velocity for uh, your startup run. If you don't choose to do that, um, generating velocities at the start of the run, what happens is that your particles will have um, no velocities, obviously, and uh, that means that your system is a, at a very low temperature. And within the very first uh, simulation steps, then will heat up, and the thermostat will take care of this. Uh, so. It's a nice if you start with an immediately warmed up system and uh, start your production from that. Um, then uh, one next section for the bonds treatment uh, is something that goes also again into uh, the force field. Mostly what we want to use for constraints is uh, neither none or all, but really the H bonds uh, constraints. This is also what uh, lots of uh, force fields have been parameterized for. Uh, but again, check your force field in this case. Um, if you constrain all bonds, be aware that you might um, uh, miss some um, conformational changes uh, due to the uh, constraints because then cis to trans um, changes are much harder for the system to do because the bonds can't stretch uh, for such a rotational movement. Um, for the rest of the parameters, it's usually fine to use the default parameters. So we use uh, shake for water molecules, links for all other constraints uh, usually, and uh, do quite fine with these the default parameters. And then um, we are through with uh, the main um, the talk here. And um, I encourage you, and I hope you have uh, some questions uh, coming up. I'll try to answer now um, in the next uh, steps. I think um, Rossum will moderate. Yep. Thank you, Christian. Thanks a lot. Uh, I hope the presentation was useful for most of you and uh, looking at the list of questions, it seems like it is. Um, some of you have had problems with audio, I hope it's been solved by now. Um, so the first question is from, uh, just a second, uh, from Horacio. Uh, actually, he has a couple of questions, so let's see if we can uh, have audio with him. Horacio, can you hear us? Yes, hello. Excellent, we hear you, yeah. You can speak uh, directly with uh, Christian. Oh, Hi. perfect. So thank you, thank you for the seminar, uh, Christian. Uh, I was just wondering, um, for example, uh, what the MD, uh, VV, uh, AVEC, would be, because I, I haven't seen this option before. I think it's a uh, oh, new yes. one. 
And uh, the second question was, uh, how is the measurement of the Verlet buffer tolerance? Uh, sorry, the last question I didn't get. Uh, how this Berlet buffer tolerance is, is measured? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, I start with the first question. Um, uh, that is uh, the um, for the integrator, the options, um, there were many options, and one of the options was uh, molecular dynamics, molecular dynamics velocity delay, and then as a third option, molecular dynamics velocity delay, uh, VB, um, AVEC. And this is um, also briefly explained in the manual. And uh, the idea here is that we use a velocity value algorithm where we um, do the um, kinetic energy calculation at a different uh, step um, of the evaluation. So the idea with both velocity value and uh, velocity value AVEC is that you get um, at a different point, uh, the, you have uh, the velocities um, calculated and you get a full velocities at the full step uh, and slightly but ever so slightly uh, more accurate results for some oh. special dynamical oh. property of your system but it's usually really not recommended and um, to use for your plain molecular dynamic simulation um, sim uh, setup so uh, the it is recommended if you're interested in very specific thermodynamic properties of your system at a given time. Um, but uh, yeah, so th this is a brief, um, uh, just a rather pointer than a complete explanation of this. Uh, but yeah, again, uh, you will find a bit more in the uh, manual on the MDP options. Um, okay, the, okay, thank the, you. And then uh, the second one um, about the um, Melee buffer tolerance. So the idea is that um, if you use a uh, list of um, neighboring atoms um, to speed up your simulations, so this is the whole neighbor list uh, search approach. The idea is you keep uh, everything that is close during your simulation and during a time step conceivably might um, run into your interaction range, uh, for example, uh, for the um, Van der Waals interactions. And um, now if you um, think of a, like a case where suddenly um, an atom um, becomes or a small water molecule becomes very, very fast, um, then this might happen that you miss out on some interaction energy just because um, you weren't even thinking that uh, by keeping this neighbor list of all the, the atoms that might come into your interaction uh, range uh, within a certain time, um, you didn't even think that this could make it um, and uh, this is exactly uh, this uh, to energy tolerance uh, so you're missing out on very tiny bits of the interaction energy uh, when using this uh, neighbor list approach and this is um, a, um, an analytical estimate on how much you would miss out in terms of energy uh, interaction energy between atoms when using this neighbor list approach and from this you can calculate how much of a radius you need and you see this value is very uh, very tiny to make sure that you uh, really um, almost okay the interaction mm -hmm. energy so this is how it's um, how it's um, calculated uh, I, I they, see. I, I, so the, the tolerance is in terms of energy then yes exactly so the tolerance okay. is in terms of energy um, because we think this is a Way you should think about your system is um, this is the base idea that uh, whatever you do you want to make sure that you don't um, make, lose make up with generation. okay yeah. Yeah, but, you uh, but do by. you have uh, do you have in this case or would would you would you uh, keep track in this case uh, um, also the number of neighbors that are or would be enough as a function of density for example or uh no this estimate is made uh, on the assumption of a homogeneous system um so this ah. uh, but it's, okay. it's a very conservative estimate um made here for the energy term um i yeah uh i think I, in the uh one of the gromix papers <laughs> there's a, a bit more uh, content on how uh, this neighbor list of parameters are exactly uh, translated into um, 
distances, but the, the, the really the approach is really uh, to um, see what's the velocity distribution of our water molecules and um, how far do you expect a molecule to move within a certain range of time? And then saying, okay, how much of an interaction are we missing if uh, uh, suddenly some, for example, a water molecule moves in or out of the interaction range? So this is uh, the, the idea. Okay, okay, I got it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, then we have a question from John uh, Cabrera. Uh, let's see if we hear each other. John? Uh, hi. Hi. Hi, John. Uh, uh, I would like to know uh, how to uh, select the default uh, time step. Uh, uh, you said that it was two femtoseconds, the yeah. valid buffer tolerance. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a very yes. good question. Um, so this is one of the fundamental uh, questions in molecular dynamics. So what you want to do is uh, to calculate the forces uh, on all your particles and then move the particles forward according to the forces um, as uh, much uh, as you can to get a good sounding of your system. Now, if you move uh, your particles only a very tiny bit um, according to the forces you have, so this would, would mean a, a very, very small time step, then you spend lots of simulation time in very uninteresting system behavior, so you would see your system very, very slowly moving um, only and you wouldn't even reach the time scales that are interesting for your system. Now, if you um, start, so you calculated your forces and then you choose a large time step, that would mean that um, you move your particles forward a long um, bit. Then what happens is that suddenly you end up uh, the, your particles in a position that is um, far away from um, the position before, completely different forces and energies and interactions. Uh, up to the stage where you keep shooting particles around randomly. So if you imagine you calculate the forces on your protein and you take an enormous time step um, that uh, then uh, atoms on the very top of your protein might end up uh, at the very bottom and everything will get enormously mingled. So the question is how to decide on the time step that is exactly um, the right um, order of magnitude for this. And for this, you can look at uh, an harmonic oscillator approximation. Um, so uh, there's a really um, distinct formula that says uh, the fastest vibration, uh, that means uh, the fastest movement in your system should be um, time limiting. And for this, we use uh, the force constant to really estimate um, the uh, time step from this interaction. So. Um, the uh, usually and that's why we use also the hydrogen bonding constraints uh, usually the uh, strongest um, interactions that we still want to simulate uh, determine the smallest time step um, in the vibrations so that we can get a, st a stable trajectory with the largest possible time step um, yeah this is um, long story short um, for all the force fields we have uh, two femtoseconds without virtual sites or four um, femtoseconds with virtual sites is uh, just the recommended option that has been um, found out to be exactly in the right um, ballpark to give you a, a stable simulation protocol that uh, gives you still efficient sampling and uh, lots of uh, so say, uh, enough protein trajectory Okay, thanks, Christian. Uh, we go with the next questions from uh, Oscar, who has a question about PME order. Oscar, you can speak. Um, hi. Hi, Oscar. Yeah. yeah, so thank you very much. I just wanted to ask about the PME order because I think that you, I understood that you said something about the, like it was better for larger systems in the in the terms of communication issues but i just wanted to clarify if this also changed somehow the values of the electrostatics no it shouldn't uh, so um we see that we receive the same accuracy um if you go to a higher order so between order four and five so you, you should get the same results um 
you really just um, I, so it's a matter of a comp data compression in the end only. Um, so how you um, treat your grid, whether you have uh, fewer grid points and compress them better, or you have more grid points and compress them less. And this is a way of shifting work between, um, uh, so say, individual separated um, evaluation units. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question from Naveen, I believe, doesn't have audio. Uh, so, does the protocol that you are describing works for both protein ligand complexes or only for proteins? No, so this uh, should work for protein ligand complexes as well. So, um, there all the options um, apply. The only thing to uh, that is really important is uh, the temperature coupling should be um, protein and non-protein and not uh, protein and solvent as a was a put in here uh, to make sure that you get the right um, the right um, that everything in your system is uh, coupled to temperature both uh, correctly but that uh, yeah okay. that's um, okay. and uh, next question from Partiba uh, can you say something Partiba Oh, hello, hi. Hi. Hey. Hello, Christian. Hey. Uh, hello, Christian. Thank you for your uh, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a question about uh, the parameter that I should use uh, if I am planning a system uh, based on a pH. So, could you explain something about it? Ah, yeah, that's um, an interesting question. Um, so, what you would like to think is that uh, because pH is some kind of uh, external uh, thermodynamic property that you could just set pH equals uh, some number um, which uh, mm -hmm. at the moment we can't do in Gromics. So if okay. you want to um, have a certain pH uh, set in your system, what you would do instead is um, take your protein and uh, protonate or deprotonate accordingly uh, to your pH value. And for this, you would uh, use this um, uh, thing um, estimating the pKa of each and every amino acid um, at a given pH. So um, for this, uh, there's uh, different uh, tools around. Um, I have a small blackout to, but uh, something, okay, sorry, I, I have to refer you to Google in this case. Um, okay. I, but uh, the, the concept is um, you um, manually protonate uh, all the amino acids according to the pH you want to uh, simulate for the time being. Uh, it has been a long-standing um, idea um, of the whole the community and the uh, non charm there's a way of doing um, simulations where you just set the pH at the very beginning at the outset and something we are working on but uh, something uh, yeah um, not for now okay <laughs> thank you very much all right and uh, <clears throat> the next question is from Zavet you can Hello. speak. Hi. Hello, sir. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much for explaining uh, the basic steps. I want to know one thing from you, sir. Uh, in the prior versions of 2018, the log file used to get post evaluation time of GQ slash CPU ratio. And uh, that is not there in the 2018 uh, series. Right now, it is using 2018.7. So uh, I want to know that uh, that optimal performance uh, of this GPU and CPU does it, is it have any relation with the Fourier spacing value that you just explained in the your lecture? That is 0 0.12. And uh, in the file which I have downloaded from the website, it's set to 0 0.16. So does it have a relation to the optimal performance of the uh, simulation system? Um, uh, okay, um, well, I'm not exactly sure uh, what ratio um, you're saying. Uh, so there is uh, the for the Coulomb interactions, there is uh, the R Coulomb versus Fourier spacing ratio that uh, I suggested to keep to a constant value that is then tuned. Was this the ratio you're referring to? Um, uh, so, <clears throat> so it's in the uh, last of the log in the log file towards the end we used to get a post evaluation time it says that optimal performance of this ratio should be close to one 
so if it reports something value greater than one or less than one it means i have some performance loss during the simulation running in a gpu workstation with uh, uh, of course two gpu cards ah okay um so if i understand this correctly there's a um, this is a matter of how much work of uh, the simulation you um, you put on the gpu versus how much work you do on the cpu yes, and uh, yes, and uh, for this um, there's an indirect um, influence of the mdp parameter options uh, in the how you set the electrostatics and there also the pme order can influence this type of work but then most importantly it's a matter of a command line options you use for starting the simulation run and um, how you um, how many gpu um, um how many gpus you have versus how many uh, cpu you have and this also drastically changes with different uh, gromex versions in this case so um it's a bit hard for me to uh, just write from a distance um immediately understand uh, how to uh, to give you directly the advice uh, on what to do to op achieve the optimal performance here um on the setting so usually um yeah, um, I, I, I would defer this a little bit uh, and suggest uh, you send me uh, an email personally, uh, just um, st stating the issue again, because this makes it a bit easier uh, to answer your question. Yes, sir. Uh, sure, sir. Yeah, okay. Thank this you. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, next we have a question from Amit. Let's see. Amit, do we hear each other? You can speak. Okay, I'll read the question on uh, your behalf. If I have a system that contains protein, water, and a single or multiple copies of a ligand, should I perform a separate coupling for the ligand, uh, particular uh, temperature coupling? Mm. So is this recommended to couple the as one group the protein and separately water and ligand together or have protein water and ligand as three separate distinctive temperature coupling groups i think in this case uh the temperature coupling um would work also with a protein and just non-protein um as a was given as a temperature coupling not to three systems but uh, to two systems um, should be fine in this case uh, the matter is a uh, the question is a matter of um, heat transfer between uh, the solvent and the ligand and um, in this case um, if the ligand uh, multiple or single copies of ligand of 40 atoms um, the ligand is quite uh, small and the heat transfer should be uh, fine so in this case uh, the coupling so say the water itself and uh, the ligand environment acts as a um, fair temperature bath so the differences shouldn't be large and uh, choosing protein and non-protein for the temperature coupling should also just give a, a very good result that um, gives the correct temperature in this case okay thank you uh, next we have a couple of questions from Bakari, let's see if we have audio. Bakari, can you say something? We hear some noises. Hello? Hi, yes, we hear you. You can speak up. Okay. Uh, uh, I had a question about um, running um, MDV hydrogen mass repartitioning. Uh, yeah. So, uh, it's about the time step. When you use hydrogen mass repartitioning, do you use V side? Yeah, when you use PDB to GMX, or you use uh, minus ABH? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a fair point. I didn't touch on this. Um, but yeah, as I briefly went into um, at the beginning, um, the time step. The question is uh, the fastest oscillations in your system, and of course, if you use heavy uh, hydrogen atoms, then you also. Um, damp and the dynamics. Um, that means um, the hydrogens become heavier, they move uh, less quickly, and uh, thus um, you can have, you have um, longer <laughs> oscillations and you can uh, increase your time step. 
also in this case. Um, however, um, I think um, if you want to uh, get better dynamics of your system, um, then V-sites are better um, because they will give you. So if you have the choice between the two, um, I would suggest you use uh, virtual sites um, because then the simulations will also reflect much better the actual dynamics of the system. Uh, whereas the heavy hydrogen atoms um, option is, is also a nice option to uh, give you more sampling. Um, and it will give you the right uh, free energy distribution of the system, but uh, it will give you a different dynamical behavior of the system. So, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. And then we have a question from Yergeli Kohut, but uh, he doesn't have audio. Uh, so his question is, what would be an optimal temperature coupling, tau T, for Nose Hoover thermostat. Uh, is it better to use Nose Hoover for production runs instead of very scale? Um, so usually I would say um, velocity rescale algorithm uh, proves to be just more stable and um, produces the right uh, and correct thermodynamic ensemble. Um, and um, I would I would personally prefer V rescale over Nose Hoover thermostats. For this case, um, the optimal um, coupling, um, temperature coupling uh, constant for Nose Hoover, um, I just don't know um, right on the top of my head. I don't want to say anything wrong, actually. But uh, there is, um, in this case, I can really refer to the uh, manual section um, in the uh, Gromex manual. If you go into the MD algorithms, there is a section that talks about thermostats. Um, and uh, looking at the Gromix menu under thermostats, there's a directly um, very nice detailed description of the Nosy Hoover thermostat, where the tau T, uh, the coupling, uh, optimal temperature coupling constant is also discussed exactly for the Nosy Hoover thermostat, um, which will give you a much better overview than I can just give you in a few sentences here. Um, so um, yeah, there you see also even implied value printed uh, for the tau T. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to read the questions of the rest of the participants because we are uh, already of the hour. Uh, question from Suleiman. What are the most critical options which should be changed if I use another force field? Mm. Uh, yeah, that's uh, trying or asking for summarizing all the slides where there's uh, some like blinking red thing on it. Um, so, um, the things to look out for is um, the Van der Waals interaction uh, type and uh, the um, Leonard Jones um, radi uh, the cutoff radii for the uh, Van der Waals interactions uh, to check. The uh, dispersion term is uh, important here, and um, then the um, constraints using um, these are the things uh, to check when. Um, using different force fields. I think these would be the most critical things to have a look at. Okay, next we have a question from Mayank, uh, who is asking about more details on the ref court dash scaling option during pooling simulations. Uh, seems to have uh, problems with the system blowing up in the direction of uh, pooling through a membrane. Um, mm -hmm. is, uh, is there anything specific to this option that uh, users should know about? Uh, yes, the question is, uh, and this is a bit hard for me to just understand from briefly reading this here, is um, whether this, um, the position restraints are absolute in space or relative to uh, some kind of atom positions. So if you have a, a system, usually what I would suggest um, to do is uh, to try to define your position restraints in a way relative to your molecule um, coordinates um, you want to pull towards or want to pull uh, away from, where uh, you would not have to worry about the reference coordinate scaling uh, in this case. Um, not sure this is di directly applicable. Otherwise, um, mostly scaling along the box uh, might be what you might want um, 
if uh, the system begins to blow up in this exact direction they read it here mm -hmm. yeah okay uh, then um, a question from Seke about normal mode analysis and uh, is just being curious what are the applications of normal mode analysis mm -hmm. uh, particularly in Gromax so. yeah I think um, Normal mode analysis uh, spelled uh, or played a role in the um, uh, estimating spectra, molecular spectra. Um, it there is uh, some analysis tools uh, to um, look at the data you get from normal mode analysis. However, this is for pro doing normal mode analysis for proteins is a quite expensive procedure that um, looks at the the um, changes in energy or interaction energy um, just at the very specific um, point of confirmations. So I would say uh, for most of the things um, we do with Gromix, um, the type of analysis that uh, tells you, okay, where would the protein move, what are its degrees of freedom of movement, uh, often PCA proves to be um, a method of choice uh, rather than normal mode analysis. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks. Then a question from Moritz. After the uh, so the question is that after the group cutoff scheme was removed, is it possible to still use flexible Williams force field? Uh, unfortunately, I don't know <laughs> because I don't know enough about flexible Williams uh, force field. Um, so for the most part. Uh, yeah, might be possible, might not. I, I really can't say. Uh, sorry yeah. uh, for this. Yeah. Uh, then we have a question from Yogesh. Yeah. What settings should be used for doing NV ensemble simulation? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you want to keep uh, the volume and uh, just the energy constant, not the temperature, then um, all you have to do is really just not um, make sure that uh, your system gets up to a certain temperature, then the um, energy should be conserved and make sure the system doesn't change the box size. That means uh, that uh, the pressure is not kept constant. So in this case, uh, setting all these things, uh, all the recoupling algorithms to know will result in an NVE uh, simulation. Um, now, if you set up such a simulation and don't generate velocities, this gen velocities in the beginning, then you will have a extremely cold system uh, because there's no extra energy coming into the system and your molecules, if they are not already in a local minimum uh, from the energy minimization, they will move towards uh, the whole system will move towards the uh, energy minimum and fluctuate around that, which will result in very low uh, velocities for the particles which will be reflective of a very low um, temperature if you then calculate the temperature. If you want to do an NVE simulation and uh, then that is somewhat reflective of some kind of higher uh, temperature you can generate velocities but the question is what what it really tells you um, in terms of uh, physics. Uh, so yeah, um, so some things to something to do uh, is to generate velocities if you really want to do an MBE simulation that um, has particles moving. Uh, quick question from the banjo: How to configure NDP files so that it generates XTC files as outputs? Yes. Um, so here. Um, the idea is that you use a whole pipeline of which I, I really just focus today on one aspect that is you need a structure, force field and the simulation parameters. Once you have this uh, then uh, yeah, going through the pre-processing and starting a simulation will generate the XTC outputs. Um, but for this I really suggest looking into the tutorials um, again um, for example mdtutorials.org uh, will give you one of these pipelines. Thanks. And uh, then we have a question from Zahid. Is it possible to predict thermal stability of proteins at various temperatures using MD? Uh, yes, uh, to some extent. Um, what really works neatly, and uh, there's uh, one example of the Barney's uh, study by um, people also by Excel, um, 
Vita das Gapsche ist ein bewährter Hut. For example, it, um, as a reference, um, we, we can look at the changes in thermal stability upon mutation of a residue. Um, the thermal stability of a whole protein in itself um, is, um, you can also access, but this is a, a harder task, but most often you, because uh, then you really have to look at the changes in the complete protein structure, um, but most often biochemically you're interested in um, looking at uh, what happens at the mutation and this we can definitely uh, do very well. The other thing you can also do conceptually, the question is one of compute time and whether the results are reliable or not. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks. And the last question we have is what should one consider um, when uh, setting the costs for pressure coupling, the time constant. Yes. Um, what properties of the system so are important to be considered? Um, this is a, a matter of a, the change of system behavior usually. So if you use a very tight pressure coupling, then uh, with a very um, low time constant, so very frequent pressure coupling, then often if your system is not already very stable um, in the simulation behavior, then uh, you might see um, some changes if you use the uh, Parimello uh, Raman um, pressure coupling um, of a fluctuating box sizes. So uh, the main consideration, and this is a bit more of a rule of thumb, is uh, that uh, you want the coupling tight, but not so tight that you see large fluctuations uh, in your system that uh, might lead your simulation even to crash at some point. Um, the system property is really, um, of course, one of the um, yeah, uh, equilibration and uh, how well your system box, uh, like the volume of the system really represents the um, the volume of the system at this very pressure you want to simulate at. Uh, so, uh, yeah, something to try. Um, and uh, unfortunately, no extremely easy answer of this is exactly the value you should set uh, the coupling uh, constant to. But usually, uh, again, I can refer to uh, looking at uh, the Perinello Raman uh, pressure coupling um, written up in the manual using the default value uh, or the values, uh, no sorry, the values I uh, gave in the presentation should give you usually a stable results for a wide range of systems. However. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, I'm sure that there will be a lot more questions uh, coming, um, especially as Chrome develops further, but uh, we are already way over time. Um, so if you would like to follow up, if you have more questions, please uh, visit us.bioxl.eu. We have forums there or the Gromax mailing list and uh, place your questions there. We'll be happy to follow up. And uh, I'd like to thank again Christian for the great talk. Uh, I believe it's been very useful for the whole community. And thank you all for attending today and uh, follow up with uh, all the events and training that we organize on uh, BioXL. We regularly do various webinars, uh, workshops. We are starting with virtual training. Uh, so you might find a lot of useful information there. Thank you all again for attending and uh, until the next time, this will finish the webinar. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, thank you, Rossum, awesome. for the nice hosting.